I entered my house, and the first person I saw was my son, Luke. And I said, hey, Luke, guess what? I'm not going to be coaching at Texas Tech anymore. And the first thing he said was, so we're not going to sit in the stand, or we have to sit in the stand with those people? Because my office overlooked the stadium. But I also told him, but now we're going to be able to go to spring training and do a lot of different things that we couldn't do before. 20 days later, I got a phone call on July 28th, 2015, at 2 p.m. in the afternoon. The man on the other side of the phone said, hey, Luke's been in an accident. For about a minute, I thought he was just joking. Finally, I said, are you serious? He said, yes. I said, how bad is it? He said, I just think he broke his nose. So I drove from Lubbock Cooper High School to Market Street, which is on 98 from Quaker, a couple of miles, but I didn't drive so fast. But as soon as I arrived, I saw the ambulance leaving and the helicopter was hovering above. Immediately, the fireman told me, just go to the hospital. I said, is he okay? He said, just go to the hospital. I arrived at UMC. The first thing I said was, where's my son? Where's Luke? And there was a big commotion in the emergency room. A gentleman came up to me and my wife. The first thing he said was, I need to speak to both of you. I knew it wasn't any good. He said, Luke suffered head and chest trauma, and he had an anoxic brain injury. For seven minutes, he went to cardiac arrest. So he was gone for seven minutes. And all I remember after that is I had a mask in my face because I got tingling my hands, my face. I couldn't remember anything. But I remember one nurse telling me, listen, you've got to hang in there. This is for your son. For the next eight days, we didn't know if Luke was going to make it. Day eight, we had three surgeries, three brain surgeries in one day. After the third one, the neurosurgeon said to me, I don't know if Luke is brain dead. The next day, one of the doctors said, hey, listen, is Luke a fan of music? And I said, next to sports, music is his favorite thing. So he played his ukulele. He played the song, Stand By Me. I'll never forget it. And as soon as he started playing the music, I saw brain activity on the monitor. For the next 40 days or so, Luke had a number of surgeries. And finally, on September 6th, excuse me, on August 4th, we were transferred to Cook Children's Hospital in Fort Worth, where we spent four months doing rehab. Unfortunately, it was a rehab hospital where we did very little rehab. Luke wasn't strong enough, wasn't well enough. But I knew that those people at Cook Children's were going to do some great things for Luke. September 15th, September 15th is a day I'll never forget. I mentioned earlier it was August. September 10th, we went to Fort Worth. But on September 15th, we had a meeting. Nurses, therapists, doctors. And the last person that spoke to us, the neurosurgeon said, listen, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. He showed us the iPad with Luke's brain. He said, it's all white. It's globally damaged. I'm not sure if I've ever seen a brain that's damaged. He said, based on this MRI, Luke will never use his limbs, never use his voice, and should never open his eyes. I just asked him one question. I said, have you ever seen an MRI this bad, but seen better results than you expected? He said, yes. I said, good. That's all I need to know. But as everybody left, my wife and I sat in that room, shocked, tears. But a few months later, right before Thanksgiving, we're in the room and suddenly I hear, ah, Luke makes a sound, and another sound. And everybody on the fourth floor came running because they couldn't believe what they were hearing. 
Although that was a positive, we were still told that Luke wasn't doing well enough to stay at Cook Children's. I couldn't believe they were giving up on my son, but really they weren't giving up. Because they told me Luke would get better at being at home. And on January 6th, 2016, we came home. Five months after being at UMC and Cook Children's. For the next, I don't know, eight months, I had a very, very challenging time. I have three daughters, an older daughter who actually has a son and two on the way. And I had two teenage girls. At the time of the accident, Luke was nine. But for the next eight months, I couldn't deal with anything. I didn't step foot on the Texas Tech campus where I spent 23 amazing years. I couldn't get on the campus because that was life before the accident. That was life when it was good. But finally in May of 16, I was asked to speak to the men's tennis team where I coached prior to their NCAAs. I couldn't get through two seconds. That was my first moment back on the campus. Finally in August of that year, I was asked to speak at Laura Bush Middle School where my two daughters went to school. And I spent all night thinking, what could I say to them that could impact them and also as applied to me. I speak to students, organizations all over the state talking about these messages, which you will receive a handout when I'm finished. Number one is to find your passion. I can tell by this group that all of you are very passionate about what you're doing. I was very passionate about a lot of things, sports, family, faith, Texas Tech athletics, our New Orleans Saints, but I lost all my passion. Slowly but surely I regained that passion. And the reason I'm able to do that is I started an organization called Team Loop Hope for Minds, which supports children after brain injury. Last year, January of 2018, is when we launched the Team Loop Hope for Minds nonprofit. And we raised almost a million dollars and gave out almost a quarter million dollars to families in 14 different states. Families with children who have suffered near fatal violence, car accidents, accidents like my son. It's an incredible feeling when you can help others because what it did, what it's doing today is it's helping me at the same time. Finding your passion. Passion helps move you forward. Passion gives you energy. I was going backwards, worrying about the future, and I had no energy. Even last night, I sleep next to Luke four nights a week, and I wake up every three hours to turn Luke. And I know when I woke up to turn him, his arms were cold. I didn't cover him up well enough. So then I spent a few hours thinking about Luke, and I don't get as much sleep as I need. But I'm definitely regaining my passion. The second thing is don't ever quit. That applies to you, it applies to teams, it applies to everyone, and certainly it applies to me. I do have moments where I don't know if I can keep going. But I know when I wake up next to Luke, I don't quit because he doesn't quit. What you all can do in two seconds, it may take Luke 45 minutes. But that fighter, that baseball player, that athlete that I have and had, never quits. On that handout that you'll receive, there are ways to follow us on, pray, on, on Facebook. Pray for Luke Siegel on Facebook, Instagram. And I would ask you to follow for a couple of reasons. Number one, I believe Luke is improving because of two reasons. One, because he is a fighter, he's a competitor. And two, because of people like you who pray for us, who support us, who follow our story. But also when you go on Instagram or Facebook and you see what Luke is doing, maybe if you're having a bad day at home with your children or at work, maybe Luke will inspire you and give you a new attitude for that day. The third is to lean on friends, family, counselors, coaches, siblings, parents. That applies to all of us, whether we're eight or 80. I leaned on no one for a long time. I didn't answer the doorbell. I didn't answer my phone. But now, it's the opposite. I need, I need people. I need people in my life. And I think for all of us, that's a message, whether we have children, whether we're adults, to not keep things inside. That's what I did too much. Because it didn't help me, and certainly didn't help Luke. 
The fourth is to be careful, make good choices. That may not apply as much to all of you, but when I got that phone call that Luke was in a golf cart accident, I couldn't believe it because I didn't know his family owned a golf cart. And one of the biggest mistakes I think that parents make when they buy golf carts is they don't know what they bought. They don't know that they are souped up, modified, heavier, faster, taller, and that's how they can tip over, and that's what happened to Luke. The golf cart, over 500 pounds, landed on top of Luke. Making good choices. We tell that to our children every day, and yet it takes one split second to change a life. The fifth is to have faith. Without my faith, I couldn't stand in front of you. This isn't easy. My faith is tested every single day. We're two months away from four years. Four years that this happened. I really feel some way it's like four days. In August of 2016, I was driving around town aimlessly. I didn't know where I was going to end up. If there had been a cliff, maybe I would have driven off that cliff. But I ended up at Market Street on 98th, which is strange because the accident was just a mile away or less, and I didn't want to be there. I didn't want to drive down Indiana. Even today, when I got in Indiana, I can't look in that direction. I ended up at Market Street. I had my head down. I'm parked away from everybody. And all of a sudden, there's a knock on my window, startled me. And this man, who I've never met, said to me, hey, I'm praying for you. One foot in front of the other. And then he walked away. One foot in front of the other. That has now become my motto. I have to remind myself to put one foot in front of the other. All of you, when you go to lunch, will take for granted that you're able to put one foot in front of the other. I hope and pray that one day, that little hero of mine will be able to put one foot in front of the other. And there are many days I feel paralyzed that I'm not able to put one foot in front of the other. Another amazing story that happened to us, I was in Arlington a few months later at a basketball camp for my daughter. And we were just sitting, Luke was in his chair and I was standing up next to Luke. And I've never had anyone walk past us without at least acknowledging us. A smile, a sympathetic look, an occasional, can I pray for you? This woman walked right past us, head down, walked five feet past us, stopped and turned and said, you were chosen for this, and then walked away. I wrote about that on Facebook. I was chosen for this. I'm not a big, big fan of everything happens for a reason. That quote bothers me. When I heard that, maybe I was chosen for this. The coach in me that coached Texas Tech for 23 years now coaches a different team. Team Luke, hope for minds. I choose to believe that. The one thing I do know is that Luke has inspired a lot of people. And for that I'm grateful. For that I'm, I'm comforted. I don't go too many places in Lubbock where someone doesn't come up to me and say, hey, I think about your son every day. Or I change the way I parent. Or my son now prays. All those things matter. Inspiration is important. Today, I feel like I'm inspiring parents when someone calls me up and says, listen, I was told that my son or daughter needs to be in a home where we should pull the plug. And the fact that I can give someone hope gives me hope at the same time. But not only has Luke inspired others, but there are others that I know today are inspiring Luke. I mentioned music. Luke's favorite musician is Ed Sheeran. I played Ed Sheeran to Luke all the time. He didn't want to hear Bruce Springsteen too much, but he wanted to hear Ed Sheeran. Well, I went to see Ed Sheeran in concert, went backstage, gave Ed Sheeran a bracelet, told him how much Luke loves his music, and I know Luke was paying attention. The concert starts, Ed Sheeran begins to play his guitar, and I see the bracelet on his hand. I'm from New Orleans. You are looking at the greatest, biggest 
New Orleans Saints fan you've ever seen, and that was Toluk. We made a deal that every single year we were going to go see the Saints play in New Orleans. We made it three times. In 2015, we missed. But in 2016, we went to see the Saints play. And just one month after the accident, I reached out to the Saints. And I said, listen, Drew Brees is Luke's hero. Can you have him send Luke a video? He sent a video to Luke. And in that video, he said, one day, I can't wait to see you in the stands. Cheering loudly. So in 2016, we went to practice. Drew Brees came up to us. He said, hey, Luke, one day I'm going to throw you a ball. The following year, 2017, one of the players came up to me and he said, listen, Drew wants Luke in the end zone, in the corner of the end zone. The last play of practice, Drew threw a ball to Luke's friend who caught it and handed it to Luke. So he threw Luke a pass. He came up to Luke and he said, listen, after we meet the Bears tomorrow, I'm going to get you the game ball. And that game ball is sitting in our living room. We've seen Drew Brees four or five times since then. We even went to that awful playoff game a couple of months back <laughs> because the Saints should have been in the Super Bowl. And I know there's probably there's probably a few of you that are Dallas Cowboy fans. But I'll tell you that. No, no, not this morning, please, not this morning. And I'll tell you that my communication with Luke now, it used to be blinking his eyes. But was that Luke blinking his eyes to me? Or was he blinking because he needs a blink? A couple of years ago, we progressed to moving his tongue. Luke, do you think the Saints are going to beat this Denver Broncos? You move his tongue. And you're like this. Do you like the Dallas Cowboys? And he would not move his tongue. <laughs> Drew Brees means the world to us. He came to Lubbock. Last May, May 9th, Civic Center helped us raise over $100,000. June 12, 13, and 14, we're going to New Orleans to watch the New Orleans Saints practice. And we're going to spend three days with Drew Brees. And I know Luke knows Drew Brees. I know. If you could for a second, if you closed your eyes and you pictured or you heard me speak, you understood what I'm saying, but you can't respond. You're trapped in your body. That's my son. But I'm convinced that Luke understands. And I'm also convinced that Luke one day will do what everyone told us he wouldn't do. He will speak. We've also had Patrick Mahomes, of course, from Texas Tech, reach out to us. He wore Team Luke Pope for Lions cleats when they played the Ravens in December. Help us raise a lot of money. Elvis Andrews of the Texas Rangers is Luke's favorite baseball player. Elvis visit Luke in the hospital. Elvis sends videos to us all the time. Dick Vitale, many of you know who he is, ESPN announcer for 40 years, came to the arena last week. He was an amazing speaker. Did a great job for us. One of the things that I need to help other families, I need our story out in the country, all over the country, ESPN, getting on Ellen, Dr. Phil, whatever, because the more people that know about Team Luke Hope for my Minds, the more I can help other families. My partner called me on the way here. We received six applicants in the last two days. Bittersweet, fantastic that we can help them, but awful that we have to help them. In May of last year, in Fort Worth alone, there were 19 near fatal drownings last year alone. That's just one of the things that happens to us that I'm learning about. And you wouldn't think it, but pediatric brain injuries happen so much more than you would realize. I'm a tennis coach. I don't know anything about the brain. Some would say I don't really have one. But I've learned a lot. I learned how to change a trait. I know Luke better than anybody. I'm with him, with him all the time. There have been a few setbacks that have happened to us recently. 
In Fort Worth, we go to the Neurological Recovery Center. It's a one-stop shop for children and adults that have suffered brain injury, spinal cord injury, strokes. And we went in 2016 to get on that machine called a locomat. It's a robotic machine that helps children and adults walk. And we are partnered with Covenant, and that machine will be here in Lubbock in July at Trust Point, so those adults and children that need it, we are able to help them. And for that, I'm so excited. But in September of 16, Luke got on that machine for the first time. Ten minutes into that walking, he made a sound. I wasn't there. My wife was there. They took him off the machine. Maybe it was his ears. He has ear infections. My wife took him home in the hotel in Fort Worth, and he kind of cried out. It was still bothering him. The next day, he was still crying. My wife took him to, to the doctor. His ear was fine. Well, let's give, let's give the local man another try. We come back the next day. As soon as he gets on the machine, one of the therapists realized his knee was a little swollen. Immediately, my wife went to the doctor and found that Luke had broken his femur. So for 36 hours, my wife was carrying him on his broken femur. It wasn't until August, the following August of 2017, that I said, we've got to go back. And for the last 22 months, I have, dropped, I have driven nearly every week to Fort Worth every Wednesday morning, and I come back every Friday night. My van is 29,000 miles, I have 85,000 miles. But there's a lot of good in that drive to Fort Worth because it helps me. Sometimes being in Lubbock is the hardest place for me. When I drive down Milwaukee and I see the baseball field, or when I see a father and a son, and today is the last day of middle school. Luke had his award ceremony a couple of days ago. I couldn't go. I couldn't see those friends of his. It was too tough. But that machine, I think, is going to change. Luke. There are things that, there are words that I, I've thought about that I didn't think much about earlier, and one is, it, is inspire, inspiration. We all need to be inspired. I hope that I was inspiring to my college tennis players, that I inspired them to be better student athletes, to be better people, to eventually become fathers and husbands. I know Luke is inspiring others. The other word is hope. I used to hope that the Saints would win. I used to hope that Texas Tech would win. Now I hope and pray that Luke will get better. And there are people in this community, Lubbock has been amazing to our family. Chris Beard, basketball coach at Texas Tech, I was just there yesterday. He spoke, and what he and his team have meant to us, it's hard to, hard to describe. You see, I don't keep Luke in the house. We get out, we do therapy. We have therapy every day, two, three hours every day. I push Luke, I work Luke, because that's the way Luke is gonna get better. That's the way all of you will get better when you continue to work hard at what you're doing. I don't listen to what people tell us we can't do. I have optimism of what Luke will do. Don't get me wrong, I may come across as strong. In the middle of the night, come see me, I'm not as strong. I can be fine on slide, one mile later I wake up not so good. But I keep going because of that little boy in that room, because of how much he fights. Hope. I now have hope that I never had. Not too long ago, a couple of years ago, I went to church with my family. The first and only time I've been with the entire family to church. And I listened to the band. And I loved the sound. I loved what it sounded like. So I called the pastor. I said, listen, would you do me a favor? Would you write a song for Luke and for me? And he said, that's a lot of pressure. And I said, I know, but let me tell you about it. In a couple of minutes, or less than a couple of minutes, you're going to be able to watch this video. This video is on YouTube. It's called My Boy. There's nothing more pressure-filled than when someone sends you a song 
that's about you and your son. You hope that you like the music, you hope you like the words. And I love both. And I play this song. I'll ask you, do you want to hear our song? He says, yes. In closing, March of last year, I was asked to write a book. And I said, I would love to. And in July, I called the agency back and I said, I have no time to write a book. Can we just get someone to write it for me and I will tell them all about my story. And she said, I need to hear it from you and I want it done in December. Six months to finish a book. Well, I used to be very disappointed. Not as much lately. Don't exercise. I'm always tired. Eating poorly. But this book, writing this book, gave me discipline back that I had lost. And for that, I'm really grateful. I spent six months writing nearly every day. Every day. And I finished that book at, at the end of December. And each of you will have a copy of that book. I've signed that book. And, and that book to me is about hope. Not just hope for families that are in our situation. But every family goes through something tragic, whatever it is. And hopefully our story can inspire you, can help you, and maybe you can pass it on to others. 100% of the proceeds of this book goes to Team Live Hope for Miles. We have merchandise that we sell. And I love, I used to love watching people across town wearing Texas Tech tennis. I was someone that loved to be a promoter, a marketer. I loved having fans all over the city and state wearing Texas Tech tennis. You know why? Because they, they knew about us. It was awareness. Texas Tech didn't like it because I spent a lot of money on shirts. But I'm doing the same thing now. Because when I see someone wear Team Blue Coat for Mines, I know why they're wearing it, which is sad for me. But I also love while they're wearing it because they're thinking about Luke. Sometimes when I wear this bracelet of mine and it says Team Luke Hope for Mines, I have to be reminded to pray not only for Luke, but to pray for others. The impact that Luke is making, the impact, hopefully, that I'm making, I don't take for granted at all. So at this time, I would love for you to look at the screens, at the screen, and the name of this song is called My Boy.
friends, family, coaches, counselors, siblings. Make good choices, be careful, and have faith. Thank you. 